welcome to lecture two. In lecture two, we're going to be taking some notes. So grab yourself a pen and a piece of paper and get ready. All right, so we're going to talk about the different types of evolution today. There is micro. Microevolution. And microevolution is change in a population over time. Change in a population over time. A population is one species in one place at one time. So um, there is a population of humans in my house, but there's also a population of cats in my house. We don't include both because it has to be one species. If we have micro evolution, that implies that we also have macro. Macro evolution. Micro being small, macro being big. Macro evolution is the formation of a new species. or something bigger, like a new taxonomic group. We have a vocab word for this. The formation of a new species is called speciation. So speciation. Awesome. Let's talk about microevolution first. Microevolution uh, involves a change in a population over time, but what are we changing? What we're changing is the allele frequency and that is going to be the rate of alleles in a population. I'm going to abbreviate population pop. And we're also going to be changing our gene pool. So if frequency refers to the rate of alleles, the gene pool is the sum of all the alleles. all alleles. That was hard to write in a population. So changing the gene pool and the allele frequency results in microevolution. Changing a population over time, which is microevolution, can, but not always, result in macroevolution which is the formation of a new species, we call that speciation. How do we change the allele frequency and the gene pool over time? So let's think about that for a moment. How do we change it? That's our question right now. And your notes don't have to look like mine, by the way. I just like to organize it kind of in a flow chart. So we can change our allele frequency in our gene pool in a couple ways. We can change it with mutation. You know all about mutation from cell bio. Really exciting. We can also change it with natural selection. So some of these alleles are going to be more successful in an environment than others. If your animal is not well camouflaged, it might not be able to reproduce that changes the rate of its alleles in your population. That would be natural selection. 
Fun fact, natural selection can produce adaptations. An adaptation is a trait that improves fitness. Fitness being your ability to reproduce and have viable offspring, how much you're contributing to the next generation. The third way that we can change, change the allele frequency and the gene pool is with gene flow. Gene flow is going to be thought of as alleles entering or leaving your population. This is occurring via immigration. So an organism comes into your population bringing a whole new set of alleles to potentially spread to the next generation. Or emigration, which is where an individual in your population leaves. So I was born in San Francisco, but now I live in Portland. I emigrated from San Francisco and I immigrated to Portland. When I moved from one location to the other, I took my genes with me. So my genes have changed the frequency and the gene pool in my population because I brought them with me. Then the last thing that we can do to change our allele frequency in a population leading to microevolution is genetic drift. So gene flow is immigration and emigration, bringing new genes in or taking genes out of your population. Genetic drift is random chance. Not conscious. This is something like a wildfire kills half of the trees in your garden, or a squirrel tries to cross the road and gets hit by a car. It's not intentional, and it's based just on sheer chance. I think it's kind of unfortunate. Flow and drift sound similar to me. So genetic drift is some of your population will not be able to reproduce based on random chance. And flow, you're flowing from one place to another. That helps me remember it. When we're thinking about genetic drift, we have a couple examples that are important. One example is called the bottleneck effect. In the bottleneck effect, only a small portion of your original population survives some kind of catastrophe. So let's say that um, there is a, a new disinfectant that you use on your kitchen counter and it kills most of the population of bacteria, but not all, that would be a bottleneck effect. Whatever is left over is not a good representation of what you used to have, and so you've changed the allele frequency and the gene pool. Another example that's important to us is called the founder's effect. This is kind of similar to the bottleneck effect, but it's not the result of a disaster. So this killed off most of your population. And in the founder's effect, a small part of your population moves and establishes a new population. One of the examples that we like for a founder's effect is a, um, a group of birds flying out to a new island and populating it, like the Galapagos finches. Or, a small group of humans migrating to a new location and starting a whole new population. It's not immigration or emigration. It's not gene flow because you're not adding to a population that already exists. This is starting a whole new, you're founding a new population. So that's how these two are a little bit different. That was microevolution. Let's talk about macroevolution.
So speciation is going to be the formation of a new species. We're creating a new species, that's super cool. And there's a couple ways that we can do this. You can form a new species allopatrically or sympatrically. Allo means different. And Patrick means location. That's actually the root of the word patriot. You're, um, you have strong feelings about a place. You're a patriot. You like your location. So allopatric means different location speciation. In allopatric speciation, there is a geographic barrier between a population that prevents inbreeding. So, for example, if I had a population of squirrels living in the forest and a river changed its course and it divided the population right in half, some squirrels would be on this side, some squirrels would be on that side. Squirrels don't swim well, so they can't cross the river. They can no longer breed with the squirrels on the other side of the river. That would be allopatric speciation. Um, this wouldn't be a burden for a bird, right? Because a bird could just fly over it. But imagine that you had that river and it decided to split into two different rivers. You could have two different populations of, say, um, water lilies in both of these rivers. But since they're not connected, they will not get together. They will not be able to reproduce. If this river, like, meandered backward, then you could undo the separation. But allopatric meaning different location, there's some kind of physical barrier. Think about the trees on one side of the Grand Canyon and the trees on the other side of the Grand Canyon. The other type of speciation that we have is sympatric. So sympatric speciation I'm going to draw a line here so I know that that was not part of my sympatric speciation. Sympatric speciation occurs in the same location. So there's no longer a barrier, it's in the same location. There's a couple ways that this works. So if I'm in the same place, I need to have isolation between two of my individuals before I can have speciation. I'm going to describe that as potential breeding partners are isolated some way. but they're still in the same location. Still in the same location. How does that happen? It happens in a couple different ways. You could have temporal isolation Temporarily forgot how to spell isolation. I'm not sure it's correct. That's okay. Temporal isolation is going to be seasonal. Like if my flowers for my tree only bloom in March, they are not going to be fertilized by pollen that is produced in December. 
they're not in the same season, they will not breed. They could be right next to each other, like physically right next to each other, but they are isolated by timing. Then you have ecological or habitat. That's kind of what it sounds like. It's like if there was a tree, this is my tree, and one bird lived in the top and one bird lived in the bottom and they spend their entire life in the top or the bottom, they will not reproduce together because they will not interact. They're still in one place, they're still in one tree, and they still might have a reproductive season at the same time, but their habitat keeps them separate. Another example would be like if I'm in a lake and here's my lake one fish stays near the shore and another fish stays near the bottom, these two are not going to interact and thus they're not going to be able to reproduce together. They are isolated based on their habitats. The third way that we could end up with different species in the same location, sympatric speciation, is behavioral isolation. So behavioral isolation is um, when the two organisms don't recognize each other as mates. So they could be standing right next to each other, but they sing different songs. So example would be bird songs. Or they have different feathers, um, or they have different types of mating displays, or, you know, if you want to extrapolate to humans, they chew with their mouth open and you find that unbearable, that would be behavioral isolation. You would not mate with that person based on one of the behaviors that they are exhibiting. We also have genetic, I'm sorry, gametic. Which often is based on genes. That's when the sperm and the egg will not fuse at all. So that means that you had a mating event, there was copulation, but it didn't produce a uh, fertilized zygote. So they're still isolated, they're not going to be able to reproduce together even though they're in the same location. And then lastly you have mechanical isolation. This is when the, the genitalia just don't fit. That's a T. Genitalia don't fit. Um, for example, bugs have really odd shaped genitalia and they have to perfectly fit together like a lock and a key. And if they don't perfectly fit together, there will not be any chance for the sperm to meet the ova, whatever form the ova is. Another example that we like to use is, um, think about a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. The genitalia do not fit that would be mechanical isolation we always say that as an example but there is a great dane and chihuahua mix it was a male chihuahua and a female great dane and they did produce an offspring so not the best example of mechanical isolation but visually it works now these five types of sympatric speciation are all prezygotic Each of these prevented a zygote from forming. You couldn't get together because you were in the wrong season or the wrong habitat or the bad behavior, um, or you tried to get together, but you couldn't get your sperm and your egg to fuse, so there was no zygote, prezygotic isolations. There's actually postzygotic isolation too. Um, we don't use the word isolation anymore because now your organisms have got together and they've made a zygote, so you've had a zygote produced, there has been a mating event, but the 
offspring is not considered a viable offspring for one of three reasons. The first one is called hybrid inviability. Inviability means that it does not survive. This hybrid would miscarry and it would not go to full term. You could also have hybrid sterility. That means that you produce an offspring, but your offspring cannot produce offspring of their own. They are sterile. So it's kind of a dead end. You and your partner produced a child, but your kid can't have kids, and so it will not create a whole new species because it cannot reproduce itself. Similar is hybrid breakdown. Hybrid breakdown is interesting. It works like this. The F1 generation is fine. And then the F2 generation is unhealthy. So your offspring can produce offspring of their own, but the grandkids are sick. The grandkids are not viable or they're sterile or they're just really sickly and they kind of die before they're able to reproduce themselves. And so your hybrid that could potentially become a new species just breaks down and does not become a new species. These three options are post-zygotic. You've made a zygote, except the zygote for one of these three reasons cannot continue to reproduce and thus you will not have a new species created. Another way that we can affect the allele frequency in a population is with sexual selection. Sexual selection is where some mates, um, some individuals are better at succeeding in getting mates than others. And that can lead to sexual dimorphism. So sexual dimorphism is when two organisms of different sexes look different in their body form. So for example, Male lions have a mane, but female lions don't. Ducks, mallards, which are the males, are brightly colored, and the females usually have a matching color, by the way, but are not as brightly colored. Here you have a peacock with these outrageous feathers, and then you have the pea hen. So they are the same species, and you can tell that this is a male and that's a female. Same with these two uh, ungulates, these two deer things. One has a antler rack and one does not. So you can visually tell the difference between the male and the female. The reason being that this female prefers males with more fancy feathers. So this male will um, reproduce more often than males with less fancy feathers. And that leads to his genes being overrepresented in the next generation. So it changes the allele frequency. There are lots of organisms that do not have sexual dimorphism. For example, dogs and cats. Looking at this picture, you can't tell which one is a male and which one's a female. One is a male and one is a female, same for these lovebirds and these orca, but their overall body form does not look different. Their genitalia is different, but nothing external about them. Besides for the genitalia gives away their, um, their sex. In sexual selection, we have two types. We have intrasexual selection and we have intersexual selection. So in intra, this is when one of the sexes, the male or the female, chooses who they want to mate with. This is females choosing the males with the biggest tail feathers or females choosing the male with the best mating call. Intersexual selection is competitions between one sex. So males competing for females, like um, lions do this, uh, elephant seals do this, different deers do this. So that would be inter because it's within one sex, 
competing for mates. Let's take a moment to look at an experiment. The question is, how does tail length affect mating success for male widow birds? I want you to pause the lecture and think about how you would test this. What kind of experiment would you set up? The way that researchers tested this was they took male widow birds and they put them in different groups. In one group, they cut off their tails, so they made the tails shorter. In another group, they left the tails the original length. And in a different group, they took the tails that they cut off the original birds and they glued them on to make even longer tails. Then they measured which males produced eggs in the number of nests. So if you had one nest, that means that you had one mating success. If you had five nests, that means that you had five different mating successes. And the data looks like this. We have the mean number of active nests from zero to three. And then we have the treatment, shortened tails, uncut tails, cut tails that were glued back on so they stayed the original length, and then lengthened tail. And if you're wondering what a widow bird looks like, check out that glorious bird. And based on the results, they found that females preferred males with longer tails, even if it's not a naturally long tail. It's glued on, like literally they glued the feathers to these birds. But even those artificially lengthened tails made these birds more attractive and they reproduced more often. That means that these birds, their genes and their alleles are going to be overrepresented in the next population. This kind of behavior is called non-random mating. And non-random mating leads to different types of selection. If we have a normal bell curve distribution, distribution, here's your frequency, so higher frequency up here, lower frequency up there, and then this is your genotype and your phenotype. So the allele for light fur of mice, the allele for dark fur for mice. And on average, most mice fall somewhere in the middle. We call this a normal distribution, just because it's a regular bell shape. In a stabilizing selection event, the mouse that is most desirable is the one with the intermediate phenotype. So the medium colored mouse is the one that reproduces the most. That means that most of the mice babies will have the same phenotype as their dad or their mom. And over time, the population kind of tucks in and it becomes narrower and taller. It stabilizes in the center. Another option is instead of the intermediate mouse having the best reproductive success, the extreme, say the darkest mouse or the lightest mouse, is the most favorable. Like if we were talking about the widow bird again, it would be the shortest tail or the longest tail is the most desirable. In that case, this mouse would reproduce most often, which means over time, these alleles are gonna be overrepresented in your population and the average color of your mouse is going to shift toward the right or the left. There's also a case where either extreme instead of just one is more desirable. And then you end up with this bimodal bell curve graph, and that is called disruptive selection. Where the average used to be the intermediate phenotype, now the average is either light or dark, but both of those has a better chance at mating than one in the middle. All right, I hope that clarifies some of this week's material. And as always, please email me. I love to hear from you. Hope you have a great rest of your day.